be seated. Now I invite you to hear now a scripture reading from Acts chapter 4. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Friends, this is the word of God for all of us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are meditated upon and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us this very day. Amen. So one of my favorite truth tellers in the world today is the contemporary prophet and fellow United Methodist, Jeff Foxworthy. (laughs) Some of you have heard of him. And one of the most truthful things I think he has ever shared, that I've heard at least, is how so many medications oftentimes have a legion of side effects that are far worse than the ailments that they are supposed to cure. And to demonstrate this truth, he came up with the following pretend commercial for an imaginary prescription eye drop called Floraflor, and it went like this. For itchy, watery eyes, it's Floraflor. Side effects may include nausea, vomiting, water weight gain, lower back pain, receding hairline, eczema, seborrhea, psoriasis, itchy, chafing clothing, 
liver spots, blood clots, ringworm, excessive body odor, uneven tire wear, <laughs> halitosis, scoliosis, loss of bladder control, hammer toe, warp floors, clutter drawers, hunchback, heart attack, low resale value on your home, <laughs> feline leukemia, athlete's foot, head lice, club foot, MS, MD, VD, fleas, anxiety, sleeplessness, drowsiness, poor gas mileage, tooth decay, warts, unibrow, lazy eye, fruit flies, chest pains, and clogged drains. <laughs> Reflecting on those countless side effects of that imaginary pill, Foxworthy concluded, I'll just keep my itchy, watery eyes. <laughs> it's an exaggeration to be sure, and yet there's some truth to that. A tiny little pill can have all kinds of effects and ramifications that you never would have dreamed of. And that truth got me thinking in light of the resurrection, if a tiny little pill, imaginary or not, can do all that, then just imagine how much more the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead can do for us. If a pill that is so small that it takes you five hours to find it when you drop it on the floor and you don't even find it until you're going barefoot through the house and you step on it <laughs> can change your life, <coughs> then how much more can the resurrection of Christ from the dead change how we live our lives too? In the Bible, Acts chapter 4 describes the impact or the side effects, if you will, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead had for the early church. And friends, those effects were not subtle. The early church, those who believed the good news that Jesus was alive, found unity in a powerful way. They were moved to live generously, and they so devoted themselves to mutual service that no one among them was in need. Yes, the Holy Spirit was at work in their lives too, but for the writer of Acts, at least for this story, such countercultural unity and generosity and mutual love were attributed to, merely to their belief that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. More than a one-day celebration where people dressed up in white clothes and went to church and then went home and ate a big meal with their family, the empty tomb of that first Easter morning had serious consequences for their lives, for those who believed what had happened. The story says that the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and Saul. Now notice it didn't say that some of those who believed were of one heart and soul, or that every faction within the early church was of one heart and soul. It said that the whole group was united with one another. And that's a pretty, uh, pretty amazing thing. I don't know about you, but I've, I've been part of a number of churches as I grew up and, and have moved around. And at most of those churches, quite honestly, pretty much everybody has looked the same. Everybody has had the same native tongue for the most part. And yet, even with all of those commonalities, we would often find some really good things to fight about. Sometimes they didn't even have anything to do with carpet. <laughs> but for the early church... This was remarkable, given that those early believers didn't even share a common language, and yet they shared their lives and everything that they owned in common with each other. They weren't of one particular nationality, and yet they were of one heart and soul. Even if they didn't all look the same or talk the same or even believe all of the exact same things, Something about the resurrection led them to be united in a way that the church has not often been able to be united since. A former teacher of mine once shared about his experience editing a collection of writings about the United Methodist Church that were published together as a book, and he proofread it a number of times. I don't know about you, but if, sometimes you can proofread something and it, you 
read it over and over and your, your brain and your eyes start to correct everything for you? Well, apparently this happened to him. Not finding any errors, he sent it to press, and at the book's publication, he thought it had been a tremendous success until a few days later, he started getting calls from friends of his who had read the book. And they said, hey, I really loved your book, but what is the untied Methodist church? As it turns out, numerous times throughout the book, he had referred to the Methodist church not as united, but as untied with a capital U. He hadn't caught this error, and since untied is an actual word, neither did spell check. But have you ever experienced the church being untied and not united? I read an article recently that described a denomination that had major disagreement within its ranks over a particular issue, and as we often do any time we... get into camps and we fight against one another, each side came up with derogatory names for the other group, and it just so happens that they also came up with names for themselves that subtly showed to everyone who was paying attention that that they were the ones who were right or orthodox, or, or they were the ones who were doing as God willed. And while this might sound similar to contemporary debates and divisions within churches and denominations, the debate that the author was actually writing about was one within the Methodist Episcopal Church in the 1850s and 1860s over the doctrine of holiness, which led to the formation of two new denominations. Perhaps the saddest part was that as those Christians fought with each other over this at the 1860 General Conference, the United States was just months away from the start of a long, bloody civil war that would leave more than 600,000 people dead, and they were fighting over what it meant to be holy. Instead of bearing a united Christian witness to a nation that was deeply divided, Christians chose instead to fight with themselves, not even over slavery, but over what it meant to be holy. Now, if I may invent a word, untiedness, that sounds kind of cool. Such untiedness continues to linger in the church with a big C and in churches with the little C. Christians have been known to fight with each other over paint, over carpet, as I mentioned, over changes to their facilities. As people outside those facilities have gone hungry, Christians have been known to fight with each other over the right way to read and interpret the Bible while gun violence claims the lives of people throughout the nation. Christians question other Christians' motives, withhold trust from one another, point fingers at each other as though they are the problem. Rather than bearing a united Christian witness in a world that still has its share of divisions. I I was thinking a, a friend of mine a while back had shared uh, about a church that, that he was part of, and he, went, he said that his church suffered from class warfare. And I thought, what on earth are you talking about? And it turns out that the different Sunday school classes in his church were at war with each other, that they, they saw themselves as competing for resources with each other, competing for potential Sunday school class members. You know, oh, we, only, we used to have 10, we only have eight. We need to get, oh, that class got, come on. You know, and they were fighting over people. They saw themselves as competing with power, with each other for power in the church. As my old professor would have said, they were untied. As another friend of mine likes to say, the difference between being untied and being united is very simple. It all depends on where you put the eye. When each person is looking out for themselves first, for what they want first, for what is convenient for them first, we often end up being untied, do we not? But when we humble ourselves and mutually serve one another and look to the needs of the other first, then even where we have differences, we can find some powerful unity and have a tremendous witness to the world. I was watching a a UMC lead talk uh, just uh, a while back uh, from Mandy McDowell, who had had shared these words earlier this year. 
Um, and in her talk, she recounted the history of St. Mark United Methodist Church in downtown Atlanta, Georgia, in the years before she was appointed to serve there. And, and for some context, that church was in the middle of the city, and it had once been a very large, uh, full church back in the day. But in the 1960s and 1970s, people started leaving the cities and moving out to the suburbs. And so that church in the middle of the city started dwindling down and actually came close to closing its doors. But the people, the few people who remained there, were united in their desire to proclaim God's radical message of love to everyone, to whomever their neighbors might be, if any neighbors ever moved into their neighborhood. And so it just happened one Sunday in the early 1990s that, of all things, a pride parade made its way down Peachtree Avenue that would pass right by their church building just as worship was ending and as people would normally be heading out the doors. Now, for some more context, remember this is the early 1990s. The church across the street from them had hired armed guards on horseback to protect them from the gay people walking down the street. They were probably the only ones more fearful than the people who were walking down the street. But the hundred or so people who had shown up at St. Mark for worship that day did something different. Instead of hiring armed guards on horseback on that hot summer day in the south, they had a better idea. They handed those sweating, hot people cups of cold water. And they didn't just hand them cups of cold water, they handed them cards that read, God loves you. You are welcome here. McDowell points out that that message that God loves you, even you, is something that never gets old. We may think that saying God loves you over and over loses its impact, but that that is always a prophetic message, no matter when or how we say it. Those hundred or so people who remained at that church were unified in their conviction that everyone needs to hear those prophetic words, God loves you. And the witness of them living out that unified message changed lives so much so that within a few weeks, they had tripled in size. I think back to a, a few months ago on a cold December Saturday morning that was probably not that much colder than today, at least when I got here, when we put together a bunch of bunk beds out in the parking lot by the thrift store for people, for children in our community who otherwise would be sleeping on the floor. Now, there were people there that day as young as five years old, I know because I brought one of them. And there were people as old, well, I, I won't say how old they were, I'll just say there were people there who were very, very wise. But on a morning that was so cold that you couldn't even feel your fingers, the parking lot was completely filled with people who were ready to accomplish something important together. Some who were there ended up giving up their whole entire Saturday delivering bunk beds to homes until well after dark that night. Some people couldn't be present there for a variety of reasons, but they gave money to help provide the materials that were used to provide the beds. I know I didn't get to hear everything that people said that day. I wasn't there the whole time, but at least in the conversations I heard that day, people weren't arguing over what style of worship is best. They weren't arguing over what kind of preaching is best or what should or shouldn't be done to our buildings. On that day, they were of one heart and one soul, united by a desire to make a difference in the name of Christ. And friends, what a difference was made. There are kids who slept last night off of the floor because of what so many of us did. Now, friends, we can look back at the Bible's account of the early church and imagine that perhaps the Acts story is a little bit nostalgic. You know, if you think back to when you were a child or, or to some carefree time in your life, you probably don't remember it. You probably remember it being more perfect than it really was. There were probably things that weren't so good going on that maybe you weren't aware of. 
the past is never quite as rosy and perfect as we remember it later. And so we can look at the Acts chapter 4 story and say, well, was everyone really of one heart and soul? Probably not. Was there really no one among them who was in need? Eh, I doubt it. Did everyone really share all that they had with each other? It's doubtful. In fact, Acts goes on just a few verses later in a story that I think gets left out of the lectionary because it's not uplifting, um, to describe two people who didn't share what they had, who didn't share their life completely with others, who kind of cut themselves off from others who actually died. And what's interesting to me about that story that we rarely hear is that their deaths didn't seem to be punishment for what they did. It seemed to be the natural consequence of what they did. Because, friends, when we trust ourselves more than we trust God, who loves us immensely, when we can't open our hands, much less our hearts, to those around us because we have them wrapped around all of the stuff that we fooled ourselves into thinking belongs to us, then a pretty good description of that kind of life is death. No, the early church probably never was quite as perfect as the writer of Acts suggests, with everyone sharing and smiling at each other while they said please and thank you and being united in all that they did. Even if it was, Paul's letters show us that that didn't last for very long. But friends, what is clear and what I think is the main point of this passage in Acts is that Jesus' resurrection from the dead had an effect on the early church. It had a tremendous impact on their lives. His rising from the dead and being alive again wasn't just a line in the creed that they said every Sunday morning. It was a truth that changed how they lived, how they loved, and even whom they loved. The event that we celebrated just one week ago turned their lives upside down and they would never be the same again. About 10 years ago, the campus ministry I was involved in when I was in college went on a mission trip and we had to fly out of the Charlotte airport and we had a lot of time to wait for our flight to board. You always have to wait for your flight to board, unless you're running late and then it boards before you get there, but that's a different story for another day. And while we were waiting for our flight, a buddy of mine decided he was hungry and he was going to get a snack. Two chicken biscuits from one of the fast food restaurants there in the terminal. And as it turns out, his eyes were bigger than his stomach, and so after eating the first chicken biscuit, he decided that he'd save the second one for later. And so when we boarded the plane, the chicken biscuit came with us onto the plane. When we arrived at our destination, the chicken biscuit came off of the plane with us. When we made it to our sleeping quarters, where we would spend that week while doing mission work, the chicken biscuit made its way onto a shelf. And all week long, as we rebuilt floors and painted walls, that chicken biscuit sat right there. A whole entire week later, as we prepared to leave and head back home, my friend did the unthinkable. And y'all get to eat lunch next. <laughs> he picked up that chicken biscuit that had been sitting on the shelf all week long, and he ate it. Now, that's not the strange part. Maybe the salt content was too high. Maybe it was so loaded with preservatives. Maybe it just wasn't even chicken at all. <laughs> but here's the thing. Nothing happened to my friend. For whatever reason, and against all odds, nothing happened. He didn't get sick. Nothing something that you would think would have turned his world completely upside down had absolutely no effect on him. And I tell you that story to ask you this question. Has the resurrection had an effect on you? Has the resurrection had an effect on you? 
Because, friends, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead has the power to turn our world and our lives completely upside down. If life has conquered death, then there is no reason for us to live with the fear and distrust of one another that so often cripples not only our world, but sometimes even the church of Jesus Christ. If life has conquered death, then we can celebrate the abundant life that is available now, that is most powerfully shared with others when we share it with a spirit of unity. If the risen Christ has opened his hands to show us that he is no longer bound by burial cloths, then friends, surely we can open our hands to one another in a spirit of abundant generosity, no longer bound by the spirit of scarcity that plagues our world and leads us to see one another as competitors rather than as brothers and sisters beloved by God. For nearly 2,000 years, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the death and darkness of a tomb has changed people's lives. As we sit here one week after celebrating that event, is it still changing yours? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you again so much for joining us this morning. If you'd like more information about our services, please visit our website, which is fumcmb.org, or call our church office at 843-448-7164. Thank you.